afternoon uh, today uh, we are going to talk about the the heckscher oli trade theory this is the neoclassical trade theory uh, the first attempt was done by professor heckscher working in the lund university in sweden south south of sweden uh, and then subsequently his student after a 10 year gap uh, worked uh, on his phd on the regional trade in europe and they were the ones uh, who propounded the most famous of the trade theories uh, till krugman contested uh, the 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 uh, the H.O. heckscher uh, trade theory. So, uh, <coughs> well, a uh, couple of assumptions which are required, uh, different from the Ricardian model, where in the Ricardian model, you had uh, technology which was different across countries. And technology was defined in terms of relative factor productivities. And all other things were same. Here, one of the main assumptions is that technology is same across countries, uh, which may be valid in today's context with the with the IT boom and uh, internet technologies all over. Uh, I think it's not a bad assumption to say that technology is same across countries, but. <coughs> If you have to explain the empirical facts of international trade, then at the end you would see that Heckscher Olin can explain the empirical facts of international trade only if they relax this assumption that technology is same across countries. Okay. So, on the one hand I am saying that it is not a very bad assumption to make in today's context because with the internet. Uh, boom and IT technology, the technologies can really travel across countries and you get to know what are the new developments. But on the other hand, uh, uh, the empirical facts of trade, which are say most of the trade takes place among industrialized countries, it takes place among countries which are closer to each other. Uh, these facts cannot be fully explained by the heckscher olin theory. And heckscher olin theory explains trade in products which differ in factor intensities. But the third empirical fact of international trade is that most of the trade is intra-industry trade, trade in products which have similar factor intensities. Heckscher olin cannot explain trade taking place among goods which are same, Germany exporting one type of car, importing another type of car. Uh, uh, the Baltic states exporting one type of modem, importing another type of modem. One country exporting one type of printer, importing another type of printer. Heckscher Olin cannot explain pro uh, trade in products which have similar factor intensities. So, the empirical facts of international trade are that most of the trade takes place among industrialized countries. It takes place between countries which have common borders, have a smaller distance between them. And third, most of the trade is uh, intra-industry trade. Heckscher Olin cannot fully explain all these three empirical facts of international trade. But now, the latest research is on that if you relax this assumption that technology is same across countries, then you can explain some proportion of international trade taking place between countries. And uh, so, uh, then people also start questioning that if you relax this assumption, then it is no longer Heckscher Olin, it is like the Ricardian type of trade. So, then people 
are now refocusing their attention on the Ricardian theory that uh, because Ricardian theory is the one which says straight takes place because of differences in 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 technology. But Heckscher-Rollin you will see that uh, it is uh, um, intellectually quite rich. I mean if you if you see the assumptions and uh, you see the proof, the proof will be very neat and uh, you will get the desired results. So, uh, uh, you have technology which is same across countries and when I say technologies, it means that you have this production function which will be a function uh, say x is a function of k and l in both the countries okay? and y is a function of k and l in both the countries. It is in that sense that you say that the technology is same across countries. Tastes are similar across countries, so uh, it will be reflected in the same indifference curves for both the countries and they are homothetic. Homothetic would mean the proportion of consumption will remain the same. So, you may be richer, but C by Y ratio will be the same across countries. That is what you mean when you say it is homothetic. In mathematical terms, the income elasticity of demand, if it works out to be 1, then you say that the tastes are homothetic. So, tastes are similar and homothetic. And this assumption is required to prove the Heckscher-Rollin trait theory if you use the uh, the abundance, if you use one of the definitions of uh, richness that is k by l h is greater than k by l f to prove Heckscher-Rollin using this definition of abundance, you require that the tastes should be similar across countries and should be homothetic. Factors are immobile across countries. Now, this is one big assumption because we are talking about uh, the economy, Heckscher and Olin were talking about economy when uh, the world war one had just happened and it, every country had put lot of protectionist measures. So, they are talking about economies where factors are immobile across countries. So, uh, as, um, as an individual, if you find higher wages outside uh, your country, then uh, this theory assumes that you, you are immobile, but you are mobile between the sectors. Okay? And the beauty of this is that you will see that trade becomes a substitute for the movement of labor and capital. So, at the end you will see that this Heckscher-Rollin, one of the offshoots of Heckscher-Rollin is that with trade the relative wage rate equalizes across countries. So, remember when, uh, so trade becomes a substitute for the factor movement. Now, remember if you have higher wages in one country and if you have lower wages and if there is free movement of labor, then the labor from here would move here and at the end what will happen will be that the wages would be same across countries. Now, this theory is predicting that if you trade uh, between countries across countries, the wages will become equal, the rate of return on capital will become equal. So, trade becomes a substitute for the movement of factors. That is one of the, the real beauties of the Heckscher-Rollin trade theory. Then, and because and they are mobile across sectors, that means the wages are same uh, within, within a country, the rate of return on capital is same within a country, because factors can move. Uh, freely within a country. Goods differ in factor intensities. Okay, so, one good is, cap is capital intensive, another good is labor intensive. 
capital intensive means k by l ratio in in the production of x is greater than k by l ratio in the production of y so they differ in factor intensity now this is what uh, krugman was contesting that uh, hexerolin is a theory which can explain inter industry trade not intra industry trade trade in goods which are uh, similar in factor intensities hexerolin cannot explain the intra industry trade it explains the inter industry trade that is trade in goods which differ in factor intensities and there are no factor intensity reversals that means with low and high relative wage rates one good will always remain capital intensive another good will always become uh, will will be a labor intensive good like um, in us agriculture is considered to be capital intensive okay and in india agriculture is labor intensive and there so at different relative wage rates one good which was labor intensive becomes a capital intensive we dispense with such possibilities we say at different relative wage rates one good will always remain capital intensive another good at different relative wage rate will always become will always be labor intensive this is called no factor intensity reversals and if there are factor intensity reversals then you will see that at least in one country the hexerolin result will not follow will not hold then um, they define capital rich as and so it's a two factor two goods two country model okay uh, you can you you can extend it to three factors three goods the real the real world okay things will become little complex and in that context there is something called the hexer ohlin wenick theorem h o v h o v so one of my phd scholar works on the on this that what happens if you increase the number of factors increase the number of goods increase the number of countries how do you then explain what is capital rich here you define capital rich as k by l by h greater than k by l by f and or w by r ratio at home greater than w by r at foreign okay so uh, this is how you define it's easy to define it in a in a simple model of 2 into 2 into 2 so then uh, this is uh, what ho model says it explains inter industry trade and ho theory states that country exports the good which uses intensively the abundant factor and imports the good which uses intensively its scarce factor in crude form countries which are rich in capital will export capital intensive goods countries which are rich in labor will export labor intensive goods so here uh, please recall uh, a country has a comparative advantage in the production of a good if it can produce a good at a lower relative price now this theory is, is saying that you have a lower relative price because you are you have an abundance of certain factors maybe you are you are abundant in uh, human capital so if you work this out for india you will see a very uh, peculiar thing india is rich in human capital it's rich in semi skilled it's rich in unskilled workers so when people start researching india's data they find this peculiar thing so india exports human capital intensive product labor intensive manufactures which is like a middle uh, uh, skill intensive and then unskilled labor intensive products what india is lacking is the r and d intensity research and development expenditure as a percentage of G gdp r and d is a minimal of what happens in 
the outside countries. So, we may be exporting uh, these human capital intensive product, but we are surely importing R and D intensive products from outside. Something like this about comparative advantage, about countries having comparative advantage. Absolutely, all countries, yeah, uh, have the same. Say the concept of comparative advantage is the same, that you can produce a good at a lower relative price. There, in the Ricardian model, uh, you have a lower relative price because you uh, the relative factor productivity of that particular sector is greater than uh, the relative factor productivity of that sector in the foreign country relative factor productivity and Ricardo defines technology in that sense. Okay. So, then now I will give the proof uh, 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 and uh, uh, the proof will take two definitions of factor abundance. One is this definition that one is capital rich if k by l in h is greater than k by l in f and the other is that foreign is uh, labor rich if w by r ratio in foreign is lower than the w by r ratio in home. Okay. Okay. So, uh, let us see the diagram. So, this is a diagrammatic exposition of the heckscher olin model. What you need is a one to one relationship between the relative wage rates and the relative price of x and y, p x by p y, where x is a labor intensive product, y is a capital intensive product. And one to one correspondence between relative wage rate and the capital labor ratio. Now, see uh, this relationship if there is an increase in relative wage rates, it increases the relative price of the of the labor intensive good P x by P y. There is a direct relationship because x is a labor intensive product. So, naturally, when x uses more of labor and the relative wage rate goes up, p x by p y ratio goes up. So, there is a there is a one to one correspondence between p x by p y into w and w by r and one to one correspondence between w by r and k by l. If you increase w by r, you employ more of capital in both the industries. Now, you can al also see that when w by r is increasing, x will always be labor intensive and y will always be capital intensive. But there are no factor intensity reversals. At different wage rates, x would always be labor intensive, y would always be capital intensive. See here, it uses less of k by l, y uses more of k by l. 
Now the only thing for the proof is that you need to assume that the W by R ratio in foreign is less than the W by R ratio in home. So, foreigners are labor rich and home is capital rich. And labor rich and capital rich is defined in in terms of the relative wage rate, relative wage rates. So, W by R in F is less than W by R in home. If that is so, W by R in F is less than W by R in H, this would mean, this would mean P x by P y in foreign would be less than P x by P y in home. So, F will have a comparative advantage in the production of good X, Y uh, H, uh, H will have a comparative advantage in the production of good Y. So, if F has a comparative advantage in the production of good X, F will export good X right, and H will export good Y. F being labor rich exports its labor intensive product, home being capital rich exports its capital intensive product. Hence the proof as simple as that, <laughs> that is the proof. <laughs> so, so, then if you go into the mathematics, the mathematics will first prove a direct relationship between relative wage rates and prices, it will show you a direct relationship between relative wage rates and capital intensities. Then what it will do before bringing trade, it will say relative price is a function of so many factors okay, on the right hand side. And then uh, from all that what will come out is this that there is a direct relationship between P x by P y and W by R and W by R and K by L. Now, look at the offshoots of the Heckscher-Ohlin uh, model which is the first is the factor price equalization theorem. So, then think of a situation after trade, what happens after trade? So, this country is uh, labor rich, it exports good X. So, it starts producing more of X, when it starts producing more of X, it would require more of labor, but more of labor is not forthcoming from the decre decrease in production of good Y. So, the relative wage rates go up, the prices rise. So, then the relative wage rates increases with an increase in production of good X. In home, you increase the production of Y. So, R by W ratio goes up or the W by R ratio goes down and then eventually they meet such that you have a common relative wage rates which will determine the common relative prices. This is the international price at which the countries would trade. This is the same price which is determined when import demand curve and foreign export supply curve, they intersect with each other and you, you get a point where world demand is equal to world supply. 
but this is also a point where the relative wage rates would be equalized. But then what needs to be seen is that the cone of diversification for both the countries should coincide. Now, here I am bringing something little technical, cone of diversification should coincide for the factor price equalization. What is cone of diversification? Cone of diversification is that if you have a capital labor ratio in your country, you can use that capital labor ratio to produce only Y or only X or you divide it between two goods in such a way that sum is used for production of X and sum is used for production of Y. So, then your relative wage rates will will move in this region from this to this. It cannot go beyond this, because if k by l is this, then there will be only production of y. If k by l is used only in x, it uh, there will be only production of x. So, your w by r ratio in foreign should be between this and this. It cannot go beyond that. And for foreign, the cone of diversification again would be from here to here. So, the W by R ratio here should, can vary from this to this only. Now, when I say that you have a common region, okay, the cone of diversification should coincide, then one can one can predict that the relative wage rates would be same. Because if they are very far apart, if they are very far apart, say for example, k by l in home is here. So, y and x, so your w by r ratio will lie from here to here. And the w by r ratio here is of the foreign is here. So, even if it moves, even if this moves, it cannot come beyond this point. So, the cone of diversification should match in common man's language that the two countries should not be very far apart as far as technology is concerned. One should not be Bangladesh, another uh, should not be US. You, if Bangladesh and US trades, you, you would not predict equalization of the relative wage rates. Okay? That is what it means. Yeah, so that uh, one of the reasons that the, the technology is uh, same across countries, so that you you don't get countries which are far apart. So the cone of diversification should coincide. Second point: What would have happened if one good, which was labor intensive here, becomes capital intensive there. Okay, so, if you bring in factor intensity reversals. Now, look at this diagram, how it will change. This good, which is capital intensive, now look at, this is a case where you have factor intensity reversals. Okay. Now, uh, look at this. Can you let me know the shape of this? Can you let me know the shape of this p x by p y beyond beyond this point? Uh, sorry, beyond this point. Now, good y has become labor intensive, good x has become capital intensive beyond this point. So, if w by r ratio increases, it will increase the price of the labor intensive good. And what is the labor intensive good? 
y. So, if p y by p x increases, what happens to p x by p y? It declines. So, then look at this shape, it comes like this. So, this is what happens if you have a factor intensity reversal. So, then, then what? So, you can always have a situation where w by r home is here. So, the p x by p y that you get, p x by p y that you get in home is this. So, then p x by p y f is greater than p x by p y in home. So, then what will ha happen? Home will export, home will export good x, right. And remember home was, home was capital rich. So, now home is exporting good x. And, and f exports good y, okay. f which is labor rich exports good y. Okay. So, do you see that uh, what happens whether the H O theorem holds or not? What does H O theorem says that a country which is rich in capital will export capital intensive product, a country which is rich in labor will export labor intensive product. So, um, home is exporting good x, okay, uh, and what is home? Home is capital rich and it is exporting good x, yeah, which is capital intensive product. Do you see this? No, see this point. You you are somewhere here. You are somewhere here, and look at x. X has become capital intensive. So home x home which is labor rich, labor rich because W by R F is less than W by R H. Home which is labor rich exporting capital intensive product. This violates Heckscher rule. But on the other hand, the other country, uh, exp the, the foreigners uh, which are capital rich, they no, the foreign which is uh, labor rich, they uh, they export uh, good Y. And why is the capital intensive product? Okay. So, hexerolene is not holding in one. So, that is what happens when you have factor intensity reversals. Hexerolene will not hold in one of the countries, in at least one of the countries. Then you can always think now, if you have W by R ratio here, what would have happened if W by R ratio was still in this? in this section, but then p x by p y would have been here. Then you would have seen that it violates, this country would have violated the Heckscher rule. Think about it, I am saying that you are here, if you were here, w by r is here, then your p x by p y is here. So, so, p x by p y in home is greater than p x by p y in foreign. Then it would have, uh, you would have seen a violation of exerolene by the foreign country. All right. So, uh, this is this is about the factor price equalization theorem and the factor intensity reversals.
Okay, so this is uh, proving the Heckscher-Rollin by the second definition, which is uh, capital by labor home is greater than capital by labor foreign. So you can see the PPF of the home; it's more tilted towards the production of good Y. Do you see this? This is home PPF, and Y being the capital-intensive product, it's more tilted towards it. This is the PPF of the foreign. Now, when you say that the tastes are same and homothetic, okay, you are saying that uh, you have the same indifference curve and C by Y ratio remains the same across countries. This is also reflected that you would consume on a straight line. So, if you consume on a straight line and you work out the slope of the PPF at these two points, you will get Px by Py in home, which is greater than Px by Py in foreign. Because remember, as you, as you move from left to right in the PPF, the relative prices go up. So, this would imply that Px by Py is greater than Px by Py in F. So, then the question comes in the exam, uh, what is required for proving the HO theorem? if you use the physical definition of factor abundance. This is the physical definition, the other is the factor price definition. So, here what is required is that the tastes should be similar and homothetic. In other words, you should consume on a straight line and this is happening if you go into microeconomics, if you have income elasticity of demand equal to 1, you consume on a straight line. So, then P x by P y is at home is greater than P x by P y in foreign. So, foreigners will export good x, home which is rich in capital will export the capital intensive product, foreigners which are rich in labor will export labor intensive product. Quick point, what happens if tastes are dissimilar? If tastes are dissimilar, you can always have a situation where in home you start liking good Y and you are here. So, if the tastes are dissimilar, compare the relative prices here with the relative prices here. Then, then Yeah, and so if Px by Py is less than Px by Py by F, home will export good X. So, home which is rich, which is uh, rich in capital, will, is, will export labor intensive product if you have dissimilar tastes. So, then it assumes underlined tastes are similar and homothetic. If you have dissimilar tastes, Heckscher-Rollin will not hold. Okay, so, there are now many offshoots of the Heckscher-Rollin. There are two theorems that I would, uh, you, I would like you to just write, which is the Stoppler-Samuelson theorem. Stoppler-Samuelson, S-T-O-P-L-E-R, Stoppler-Samuelson theorem and this theorem says a rise in the price of a commodity, a rise in the price of a commodity raises the real reward, raises the real reward of its intensive factor, raises the real reward of its intensive factor and decreases the real reward of its unintensive factor. A rise in the price of a commodity raises the real reward of its intensive factor and a decrease in the real reward of its unintensive factor. There is another theorem that I would like you to uh, just write it. It is called
आर जेड वाई एन एस बी एन एस के आई रिजबिंस की रिजबिंस की थियरम रिजबिंस की थियरम एन इंक्रीज इन सप्लाई ऑफ अ फैक्टर एन इंक्रीज इन सप्लाई ऑफ अ फैक्टर इन द ब्रैकेट पैरेंथिस कीपिंग रिलेटिव वेज रेट्स keeping relative wage rates and factor intensity is constant bracket closed increases the output of a commodity which uses increases the output of a commodity which uses the expanding factor increases the output of a commodity which uses the expanding factor intensively which uses the expanding factor intensively and decreases the output of and decreases the output of the other commodity and decreases the output of the other commodity in crude terms the first theorem links the prices of products with the factor prices and the second theorem rizbinski links the factor inputs with the commodity outputs okay one minute uh, so we'll end up here and